think uh, very happy today to welcome uh, Subhra Kavapati, who everybody knows as well here. He's uh, one of our outstanding alumni awardees for 2018. Um, I've gotten emails from some of you uh, who apparently think I was his PhD advisor, uh, which I was not. I was on his committee. I wish I were advi his advisor, though, because he's done some really great stuff in my research area. Um, he got his PhD here in 1989. Um, he's uh, a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He just finished a two-year term as president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, where, among other things, with AI becoming such a uh, hot topic among people who have no idea what it, it is, he's sort of had to serve as one of the public faces of AI for the, the last couple of years. Um, so he's one of the top researchers in the world on AI planning, and he recently has been doing things on AI systems that interact with people, which is what he's going to talk about today. Thank you. Um, it's just great to be here. Um, I should mention that uh, I used to be, actually my name is Subha Rao, as you can see, and the reason I became Rao is because when I joined Computer Vision Lab, there were already a Subha Rao. I, I shift seven C's to come to US so that I can be unique, and then there was already a Subha Rao. What's more, his last name is Subha Rao, and so Larry decided that I should be called a shorter name or something, and probably that's how I became Rao. Um, but anyway, um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my uh, ongoing research, but I wanted to also, since you know, they call me because of this uh, alumnus thing, um, I tried to look for some pictures of me and when actually I showed up in the department, and this is one that I found on uh, uh, some place on the, on the UD um, uh, photos. Um, uh, so that's actually Dan Angwin. Uh, she is still uh, working in computational learning theory. That's Carl Smith. I'm told he has passed away. He's um, a theory guy. And there I am, and as you can see, I have barely aged. Uh, in <laughs> 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 So, I mean, I lost moustache, but I'm not pretty much there. Uh, so it's still great. I mean, I have lots and lots of great memories of, uh, of Maryland. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, having an excuse to come and give you a talk uh, is always nice. Uh, of the many, many great memories and great things that happened to me, I found my life partner here, uh, the Shaitali. Uh, and uh, it so happened that she beat me to her own distinguished alumnus award five years back. So computer science department really let me down in terms of the uh, inter intra family bragging rights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, so half a decade behind scenes. But anyway, uh, so better late than never. I'm happy. Uh, there's just so many people that I'm really uh, thankful for, and I'm just great to see some of them uh, here. Of course, Larry Davis was my MS advisor, my PhD committee member, and supported me all through my graduate study. Um, I learned from him actually how to let, I mean, let people do what they want to do without worrying about whether or not something is happening like in the next month. Lord knows that nothing happened for lots and lots of months when I was there. Uh, Jim Handler was my PhD advisor. As your Rosenfeld actually got me here, uh, Dana now was on my PhD committee and he's been a great colleague in uh, an automated planning. Jim Nejia, I got to see just a minute back. He was also on my committee. Lindy Darlin, Jack Minker, who sent me a beautiful note um, this week. Uh, I couldn't be here, but you know, he was he taught me intro to AI. It's, it's still called CMSC 620, I hope. Uh, that's the graduate level AI. And then Lavin, uh, who actually was the other part of the AI establishment, Jack Winker and Lavin, uh, logicist versus uh, pattern recognition approaches, and the pendulum of AI swings back and forth. It's very much in Lavin's corner right now. Uh, and that's kind of very nice to know. And you know, I took courses with all of them, and thank you all, um, and, and thanks for all the great uh, memories and, and the time that I had here. Um, and of course, uh, while I'm thanking uh, people at EMD, I should also thank uh, the people that uh, helped me do my research. These are some of my latest students and my collaborators. Uh, I guess if they were not helpful, then I would give Dr. Arun here to give you a talk. Uh, so I thank them too. Um, so that's the thing. So when I was here, I worked mostly in what I would like to think of as uh, 
artificial intelligence related aspect. So I was doing uh, path planning with uh, Larry Davis, um, uh, mobile robot path planning, and then I worked on plan reuse, automated planning and plan reuse with Jim Handler for my PhD thesis. So some of you in this room actually think, well, duh, I mean, who won't work in AI? You know, I mean, AI yeah, is the things to be working in. But, you know, I have to tell you that when I was a grad student uh, not too long ago, um, you know, 29 years to be precise, when I actually graduated, um, it was a quite a different time, actually. AI yeah, basically is the kind of thing that even within the department, people will feel reasonably sad that you are not working on happening if somewhat boring areas like software engineering and databases, and why are you working in AI? Um, obviously, you know, as a grad student, I remember these are the kinds of books that we have to deal with in terms of outside public perceptions of AI. Perceptions of AI. Uh, the Emperor's New Mind, uh, Project Penrose, Mind of a Machine, and also basically saying, why are you people even working? There should not be any um, research into AI, both because it's not possible and because it's not useful. That's the kind of thing that's been uh, the time at that time. Now, of course, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, you know that uh, people have uh, reached you know levels of hyperbole about AI right now. So there is AI the new electricity. AI is even better than fire and electricity. AI is God. I love this that there is this toothbrush apparently, which also uses AI technology to brush your teeth. I just love it. You know, I'm really hoping that. Which values are aligned with my feet for those of you who are worried about value alignment problems. And of course, there are also people worried about AI being a huge big threat, and AI could be the worst event in the history of the uh, universe, and of course, AI will destroy uh, humanity anyway. Um, things have changed a bit uh, in, in, during my uh, time in AI, and of course, you're coming, those of you uh, PhD students working in AI are obviously in this uh, era. Uh, in fact, you can't even see a decent episode of Bojack Horseman <laughs> without there being a, um, a, a gratuitous reference to AI. This is one from actually, you know, season five, uh, episode three, I think. Uh, I was surprised that even they couldn't avoid uh, I'm not complaining, of course, on the interest in AI. Uh, as as uh, Dana said, who, how else do um, uh, nerds like us get onto TVs um, <laughs> and, and then, you know, talk about how we're going to save the world? Uh, but the thing that I really tend to think more about in my own research in terms of the uh, AI um, advances is I would like to see um, uh, <laughs> things like this, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, press releases like this. You know, AI helps the old lady cross the street and it plays with kids and basically just helps us without any drama, you know, no worries about the world ending right away. Um, now, the reason you haven't seen this kind of news is because it's fake news. Um, I just made it up. <laughs> I just made it up. I'm in Washington, D.C., so we have to have some fake news. <laughs> and so, the, what's interesting, of course, is why is it fake news? Why is it that people aren't actually thinking about AI-human interaction? And what was the reason um, that that area hasn't had a lot more interest? And uh, <clears throat> and so it turns out that AI had a curious ambivalence uh, to humans in general. Uh, our systems seem to be happiest when they are far removed from humans, right on Mars, like there's no other human anywhere, or when we're creaming the heck out of our humans. So, for example, we beat humans in chess, humans in. Uh, <laughs> Poker, humans in go, and we are surprised that when you tell the uh, average uh, Joe and Jane on the street that AI yeah, is a nice area, why are they worried? Please don't hurt us. Well, because mostly what we seem to be famous for is essentially replacing humans uh, and doing better than humans of what they take some pride in. So John Lennon has said, has a, a song where he says, "You want to help the humanity? It's just it's the people that you." just can't stand and I somehow think that AI has become that. AI is also into helping humanity but not people per se. Um, so, so in the beginnings of the field itself actually McCarthy was talking about advice taker. Janet Kaludna uh, had this book on case-based reasoning where she talks about how everybody needs a good housewife. Please remember that this is Janet Kaludna, it's a she and she too realizes that everybody needs a good housewife in the sense of somebody who takes care of all your needs. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and then uh, Dave's Hal of course even was trying to help Dave before leaving some sort of a sinister voice. So the 
question is why isn't there more, uh, what are the challenges in getting AI systems to work with humans? And uh, back in uh, uh, February when uh, I got my chance at uh, giving the presidential address at AI in New Orleans, I talked about uh, basically this aspect of human aware AI and how to sort of an evangelization of that whole area and you know, uh, try to motivate uh, the big challenges in that area. Um, so one of the things there um, that I uh, point out, and I, I will point out here too, is that in the beginnings of the field, having humans in the, in the loop was seen mostly as a potential way of cheating because the machines are so bad that humans would do everything. So for those of you uh, who might know that MTurk, the mechanical Turk, or the original mechanical Turk was actually a little Turkish man sitting in this big contraption actually providing all the intelligence for this contraption. Okay. Um, and so there was some kind of a worry about even getting involved in AI plus human combinations because that the humans would be seen as a crutch. But things have changed right up quite a bit. Now in fact we do have systems that are powerful enough and that in fact looking uh, at AI human collaboration winds up opening bigger challenges is the kind of the message that I want to give you and I'll talk about some of my research in those areas. And in fact, I'd like to point this out that there's this evolutionary theory which says that we needed the brains we have not to run away uh, from, from the lions or the tigers, but to deal with each other. We are constantly modeling each other's minds and it's this arms race between us, both for cooperation and collaboration, that may have actually led to the size, ridiculous sizes of the brains that we have. That's the you know, potential theory. And, and, and so, in, in, in some sense, actually, looking at AI-human collaboration um, is actually expanding the scope of AI. You know, it's always easier to be just smart by yourself on Mars. It's harder to get along with people. And to the extent, AI yeah, is a technology that we are developing, we should be essentially inventing the future we want rather than invent the future where we have no place in it. Okay, and so it seems to make a lot of sense to look at um, AI human collaboration. Um, so I like to call there, there is in fact, uh, thankfully, uh, a, a, a somewhat of a, a significant newfound interest in humans in AI. Uh, there are varieties of human dash AI variations, human-centered AI, human aware AI, human aligned AI, human compatible AI. Basically people somehow seem to think it's kind of useful to have humans around nowadays. That's kind of good. Uh, but you know I will basically use the word human aware AI. And then of course there are certain areas where we always had work in human aware AI. Okay, for example, intelligent tutoring systems is a great area of AI. Um, where essentially you cannot just ignore humans, you have children in humans, so you have to think about how do you teach um, them, you know. Uh, and things like social robotics, there's some work, uh, for example, in helping autistic children, um, you know, by, as a personal tutor, a personal trainer, those sorts of things have always had uh, some uh, significant interest from, you know, in, in getting AI systems to work with humans. Um, but what I'd like to kind of make us think about is that's not, these are great, these are half tugging applications, you feel good about, oh my god, when I'm helping you and etc. But even day to day quotidian applications require machines to work with humans. Okay, um, when I was here um, as a dance student, Ben Schneiderman was, Ben Schneiderman was there and he was in human computer interaction. I remember that he, one of his uh, big jobs was running the department colloquia and in general human computer interaction was not considered a big area at least at the way <laughs> i saw it at that time but you know that he's you know laughed all the way to bank i mean he's an NAE member and so on and i understand that he's now retired but you know basically having this interaction between the machines and humans has become a bigger issue in computers and humans has been the ci so now we want these computers which have the abilities to make decisions uh, and have some sense of autonomy and goals and so on. And so, if in fact all of computer science is AI from now onwards, which I strongly believe there's nothing really left, uh, then CI is really HAAI because human aware AI systems are going to be very important. Okay, 
So that's a lot of, you know, it, you will wind up needing them even in day, you know, uh, normal day-to-day -day applications. For example, machines helping you making decisions. Uh, for example, human aware digital personal assistants, uh, human aware office assistants, and also, for example, you know, a lot of people, even both in this is hidden figures uh, by that movie where you found out that computers used to be humans. It turns out in many places planners are still humans. In NASA, there's a mission planner, and if you say mission planner, despite all the money they have spent, it's an actual expert human who tries to put together missions for the, uh, the, the astronauts and the, and, and, and the crew members and so on. And so they would love to have um, an assistant which essentially is sort of more like the radar. I don't know, so this is kind of too bad because most of you probably are too young to remember this uh, MASH, uh, which is an amazing show at one point of time. And this guy, uh, Calder Potter, used to have uh, a, a secretary, I mean, actually, a, a, a guy called Radar, who was amazing in terms of being able to complete his sentences and his wishes even before Calder Potter actually is able to express them. This is like an ongoing joke. And so we need that sort of assistance who can essentially figure out what we are trying to do and provide assistance to us. Uh, and then, of course, beyond assistance, we can talk about teaming uh, humans and machines together solving um, problems. Uh, that will involve either elbow-to-elbow -elbow teaming and factory floors or remote or cognitive assistance. Where, well, for example, you are in a, um, a search and rescue scenario and uh, Humans might be happily uh, removed from the, uh, the, the actual um, scene of, of, of collapse and so on, and you can have robots actually doing the, 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 uh, the reconnaissance of the area, and they can be in collaboration, remote collaboration, trying to do teaming. And so, in fact, some of our own um, uh, examples, some of our own motivating research comes from those kinds of mixed initiative, um, you know, um, search and rescue scenarios. So as I said, increasingly HCI will sort of become human AI interaction. So I, of course, to the extent I have a bully pulpit, I also try to push for that, you know, HCI 2016, I was a program chair, and we had a special team of human aware AI, um, and then of course AAAI now has tracks on human aware, human AI collaboration. Um, and then um, I'm a part of the uh, Partnership for AI, which is this big consortium between industry and, um, uh, and, and, and academia, non-profit, about you know, uh, social impacts of AI. And one of their uh, uh, big uh, uh, themes is collaborations between the people and AI systems. So it's sort of you know, much more uh, back into um, uh, prominence right now. Uh, so now what I want to talk about is some pieces that we have been solving and where, where are the papers coming from in terms of, you know, in, in terms of these, you know, uh, high quality problems. So I want to start at, of course, the intro to AI, uh, intelligent agent architecture that I hope some of you are still are familiar with, um, where basically you have an agent looking at the environment and essentially keeping track of the state of the environment and making decisions um, uh, that will affect the environment. This is what we look at as, a, as the first 101 picture of the intelligent agents. Um, the moment you put, now of course, when there are humans in the environment, we just say that there are humans in the environment. Humans are also like you know tables and desks and chairs, and so you sort of avoid bumping into them. Maybe, okay. I hope that human aware is a little more than not bumping into humans, <laughs> right? I mean, so, I mean, I think it's like very sad to say that the best thing human AI can do is not kill people. By the way, that is one particular form of human dash AI, that is human compatible AI that Stuart Russell is very fond of. And his only goal is, please don't kill us. And how do we make sure that AI won't kill us? Uh, but I think that's sort of setting the bar too low or too high, whichever way you want to say. Uh, and I want actually to, if you want to have humans in the loop, then one question you would ask is, how does something like this, something as simple as a intelligent agent architecture change once there are humans in the loop? And uh, not surprisingly, every piece of it winds up changing because you now have humans have their own beliefs, desires, intentions, they have, and, and you're trying to model them. By the way, this is what we say, this is theory of mind idea that we assume that when we are interacting with other humans, that they have their own goals and beliefs and desires, and you are in some sense, the reason it's harder to 
reason with people in the loop, as again as just living your own life, is because you are now planning and decision making with respect to two models, one of yours and one of the humans, in the, the other person in the loop. And that's what your systems have to do. So in fact, from a planning perspective, I'll talk about these things called multi-model planning, where you have two models, two competing models, and you have to make sense with respect to both of them. So anyway, it turns out that once you have humans in the loop, pretty much every piece of this changes. I would not deliver the point here, um, but in a sense, I think you can get the sense uh, that it's not humans are not just a like an abstract, you know, obstacle to be avoided. And so we looked at a you know, bunch of challenges that come out in this sort of uh, human robot teaming, and there's like a, if you're interested in some. Um, a variety of problems that can be tackled, you know, you could look at that um, uh, survey paper. I specifically want to focus on one piece of it that we've been looking at, um, because that makes sense to you know, go into details there. Uh, so the primary challenge is really, I'm, you know, is I'm specifically going to be looking at how does an agent which has a human in the loop, an AI agent which has a human in the loop, make its decisions, make its plans. I'm a planning guy, to me, the entire point of AI is planning. You know, and, and so, uh, so how do I make decisions with humans in the loop? And uh, the and the, that basically the primary challenge winds up being modeling and reasoning with human mental models. Okay. Now, of course, if you're a learning person, you're asking yourself, "Oh my God! Thank goodness! Now I have to learn the human mental models in addition to how cats look and how dogs look." It is true. In fact, we are learning each other's mental models. But more importantly, even from a reasoning perspective. Even if I have an approximation of the model of the mind that the human in the loop has, how do I use it in my inference process? Um, and that winds up changing the inference complexity quite a bit. You know, that's something that I spend a lot more time on today. Um, so modeling and managing the human's mental state, that would be sort of things like intention recognition and uh, you know, figuring out what people are thinking of at this point of time based on presumably their expressions, their communications, and so on, and also intention projection. You want to tell, so when you are walking by yourself on Mars, you don't say, oh, now I'm going to make a turn, now I'm going to kind of stop. If you do, then basically Martians will think you're mad, because who are you talking to? On the other hand, we do say that, we do actually project our intentions while we are doing our action in the middle of other humans because that gives them a sense of where you're going. Okay, so, you know, modeling and managing the human's mental state involves recognizing their own intentions and projecting yours. I'll tell a little about the kind of work that we have done there. And mostly, the second part that I want, that's not obvious to people right away, and they think about humans in the loop, is it's not only important for you to figure out what the human's model of their own goals is, but you need to understand their model of your abilities you the AI system's abilities. Most of the interesting things like uh, the humans get uh, flustered when they say, you know, they're working with their robot uh, and so on, would be because their model of what the robot is supposed to be doing wound up conflicting with the robot actually wound up doing. Okay, so this is almost a second order. Of course, if you're a philosophy person, you'll say that there's an infinite regress there. But at the minimum, there's a second order level that you need to understand. And in particular, that second order winds up helping you provide explicable behavior, that is showing behavior that the person in the loop won't be rudely surprised by. Because you're doing what you, they more or less expected you to do. But sometimes showing explicable behavior is too costly. Because actually, at what, you know, showing the behavior that people want you to show might sometimes be too costly from your own local cost matrix. You know, because at what point of time, you know, it could be costly or it could be infeasible. At which point, I mean, for example, your advisor said, "How did you not write three papers already this month?" Okay, which was a very reasonable expectation. If you just wrote three papers, they won't question. But if you couldn't write the papers, then you have to explain as to why it is that you the amazing PhD student from Maryland was still not able to write three papers in one month. And so you're trying to change your advisor's mental model of your capabilities by having that conversation. Okay, so that's the same thing that happens here when you provide explanations, you are changing human's model of uh, the, the agent. So I want to kind of, the, the two use cases that we have looked at in our experiments um, in, 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 in when developing algorithms there um, have been one in human robot teaming. You know, so we have some robots that basically do mostly we look at um, um, the kind of um, 
um, search and rescue kinds of scenarios there. And then another one that is here is actually providing support between humans and machine planners. So for example, there's a significant interest, as I said, in NASA, for example, having a planning system that enters the land of humans and helps them. Um, you know, do decisions within planning community. There has been uh, there has been uh, interest in actually doing some of that. Has been called mixed initiative planning. But in the past, mixed initiative planning mostly involved people entering the land of planners. There have been great examples in papers, for example, of people going to the search queue of the planner and changing the notes, search notes. These are people who don't have lives. They basically are living for their robots rather than robots living for them. We want essentially support provided when the assistant enters your land, not vice versa. And so that's the other thing that we look at. Um, so I want to mention, I'll give a little bit of uh, some of the work that we do in both of those pieces. One is intention, recognition, and projection on one side, that's the smaller part, and then explicability and explanation, which is the longer part uh, that I'll discuss before um, we end. Um, so in terms of theming requiring modeling the human, of course, as I said, uh, there is a sort of, the, the machines have to kind of go by some approximate a model of theory of mind that the humans in the group have their own goals uh, and their intentions that you're trying to guess what they are. Um, and um, so um, basically the two things, there's, there's actually a lot more work in this aspect because, you know, fact, given you know, of the, the great advances in uh, vision, uh, computer vision, as well as uh, sensing technology, we do actually have the ability to do things like emotion recognition, and then that can get you towards figuring out some of the um, intentions and current behavior, current states of the humans in the loop right now. Our own work has focused more actually on using some of what you can add in terms of um, how do you add, um, let's say in this case, um, even if you have very simple, simplistic brain computer interfaces, meaning basically what the cheapest emotive brain computer interface that is possible, and even that can sometimes help you figure out, the robot can actually wordlessly figure out what you are thinking of, what are the you know specific pieces in the workspace that you are looking at, that you are focusing on. So in this particular case, what's going on here is this guy wearing um, the, the uh, BCI, the, the emotive uh, thing, is able to essentially say that I want to hold this block for me and you can then put your stacking on other blocks. And when it actually does that, he's happy uh, because without actually expressing their desires, you know, it, it, it works. They are actually able to get the things. Now, I'm not saying that we should talk to robots, but this is something that we can do. Um, you know, it's additional in addition to uh, normal communications. Um, similarly, for the intention projection, um, you know, robots can talk. This is what that's being done, and actually natural language processing in robots providing situated dialogue about where they are stuck at and so on. That's all very nice. One other thing that we've been uh, looking at is uh, using some of the augmented reality techniques. For example, the HoloLens. If you have a HoloLens, then you can the robot can essentially project into the humans. Um, visual field, in addition to what they are seeing, what else it's trying to do. So in this particular case, um, the robot is able to say uh, which particular blocks it's going to reserve by making additional, um, you know, markings on that. And that would be a way of projecting your intentions. And one interesting question in these cases is, this is sort of showing how, if you know what you want to project, how to do it. And the question then becomes, how do you actually decide what to project? Um, it turns out that that actually is connected to some of the work that I've been discussing, which is explicability and explanation. But I want to mention here that there's a paper coming out in IRAS this year that sort of talks about how to do projection aware planning, where during the planning itself, you think about what communicative actions you can do so that your behavior would be more interpretable to the humans in the world. Now, this is actually it's an inside way that particular piece should really come after the two pieces that I'll be talking about next, but it's worth noticing because I just mentioned this here. I wanted to give you a portion. 
Okay, uh, so actually that particular work, you know, these kids went to Microsoft Imagine Cup last year and had great fun uh, because these are all both, I think, the HoloLens. If you use HoloLens, you know, you get to win Microsoft Imagine, it turns out. Um, the next part that I want to talk about, and I said I was going to spend a bit more time there, is teaming requires humans model of you, the robot, or the AI system. Okay, and um, in general, the robot and human may have different models of the same task. And the AI system and the human might have different models of the same task. And the consequence of that is that the plans that are optimal to the AI system may not be so in the model of the human. This is where confusion occurs. Why are you doing this when the plan that I expect you to do is actually a much shorter plan? Why are you doing this more complicated uh, behavior? So this sort of leads to inexplicability. That means that humans are confused as to why the AI system is either doing behavior that is making that's not making sense, or if the system is actually helping the decision support, like the second example I was showing, then the AI system is providing the suggestions that don't make too much sense to the human um, in the loop because they were expecting to go to the plan in a different direction. So there are two options in that in those cases. The AI system can do explicable planning, where it can realize that my model and the human's model differ. And in fact, in some cases at least, we actually know the beginning, both of them share the model. As I say, I'll say, for example, in search in the species scenarios, the model of this particular building will be known beforehand. The layout will be known beforehand. But then after some disaster, the building's layout has actually changed. And the human outside may not have that information. The robot has the current information, and it needs to kind of wind up deciding how its behavior in this model that's correct is going to be influencing human's perception of that behavior. So it could do explicable planning, which is sacrifice optimality for the AI system just so that humans would be happy with what it's doing. Okay, the other is provide explanations where you do what is actually more optimal to you, but then be ready to explain to humans how they should change their model such that they will not be surprised as to why you wound up showing the behavior you should. And uh, so, and when I say models, by the way, as, as Dana said, I come from uh, automated planning community, you can be thinking in terms of lots and lots of models. One thing that I basically have in the back of my mind is an action description sort of model, gradient sort of models. So that's what why. So there are actions with preconditions and effects, and the human might have different action preconditions and effects compared to the human. Uh, that's the basic difference that we talking about. So in the case of explicability, essentially what you are trying to do is make the plan. The robot is trying to make the plan that's not that's feasible for it. That is actually is able to execute, but it's actually optimal in the human's model. So it's in fact, when it is optimal in the human's model, then it may not be optimal at all in the robot's model, unless the special case where both the models are the same. Okay, and so to put that in perspective, let me show you an example. So here is a scenario in our departments, our A.L. Williams building back in um, at ASU, uh, which is a um, um, brickyard. And in the fifth floor, this is the layout of the floor. And um, uh, there's a plan, which is a model, which is a map of the current map of the environment. And uh, what happens is that in a search and rescue kind of scenario, parts of this map might actually be no longer accessible because things may have fallen. And so, for example, you know, certain, certain paths are actually no longer accessible, certain paths have become more accessible. Okay, both are possible. So in that particular case, explainability means, and, and in this case, actually in general, learning mental models requires learning. Okay, but in this particular case, and, and some cases similar to this, you start with a beginning model, which is shared between the human and the robot, and, and so the robot basically knows the current model, and so at least it knows what the human still believes in, and it knows what, how to change the human's model to come in conformance with its model. So that sort of kind of you know sidesteps to some extent the learning problem. Although learning problem is very important, we do some work on that, but in this case that's not important. Okay, so in this case, what happens is that it, you can actually decide to do a, uh, so one of the things that's been shown in this video is it turns out that in one particular path, which is actually on the shortest path to the goal that the robot is supposed to go, it turns out that there's an obstacle. 
there's an amazing obstacle that we put in there. And so there are one of two things that the robot can do, which is actually avoid the obstacle and take a longer path. Or if in fact you want to be explicable, spend time making the path accessible and then go through it. Right? In this case, that's what happened. So it was essentially, you know, it's not always possible. So this also tells you the cost aspects of it. If you imagine, in fact, this was a real bubble on the floor and uh, removing all the rubble and making the path accessible would have taken a lot higher cost than actually taking a circuitous path and explaining to the human in the room, okay, this is the reason I'm taking the circuitous path. Okay, um, so that's the, basically what happens in explicability and the thing that's interesting is that here the cost is that you're trying to minimize is not just the cost of the plan with respect to your own model, your AI system model, but also you're trying to get the plan to be somewhat closer to, as close as possible, I, ideally I, you know, um, optimal with respect to the human's uh, model. Okay, you hear it person? Yeah, uh, it seems to me that another thing I could imagine a robot doing in this case would be to reason that, well, if a uh, human put that obstacle there because they wanted it to be there, so uh, should I ask permission to move it? That's a very interesting point. So in this particular case, we assume that the human didn't do it, but there's some work that we did where robot can actually do this stig what's called stigma J collaboration. You modify the environment and use that to collaborate. And that is almost possible. So in fact, one thing, that's a kind of a segue to, work, uh, to a later part that I would want to get to, is that the moment you start modeling other people's mental models of the environment, it opens the door for cooperation. It opens the door for adversarial reasoning too. It opens the door for lying. And in fact, you know, and as an AI guy, I was the happiest when I found that my son can tell lies. <laughs> lies. <laughs> Because that means that he has a theory of mind. And he realizes, and by the way, I mean, some of you should go back and look at the psychology literature, kids below four years age think whatever they believe in is believed by everybody. Kids who were born right then think that the world is entire kumbaya connected to them. Okay, and by about three years, they still think that whatever they believe, other people believe. After three, four, five is when they start realizing that their models are different. That's what opens the ability to lie. So lying is high form of intelligence. And integrity is ability to lie and choosing not to. Integrity is not, not having a brain so I can't even lie. Okay? So I hope that, that's what I tell my students, you know, I assume that you have brains and you know how to cheat, but assume that you have the integrity, I'll assume also that you have the integrity not to exercise that part of your intelligence during my class. Okay, so but I mean, in general, the mental modeling does bring up that issues and you know, that but you know, coming back to a more um, uh, mundane example here, you are having a more um, complex optimization um, problem here. And it turns out that if the, if the model is known, uh, then this optimization just becomes an inference problem. If the model is not known, then you need to learn some version of figuring out how far this plan is with respect to the plan that the human would have come up with. In some work that we actually done in, um, you know, I think last year, 2017, uh, we showed how basically trace knowledge, you know, traces of plans that humans have produced can be used to figure out their model of the environment. And so in this particular case, we'll wind up learning a labeling model which will become a stand-in for the human's mental model. And so if the labeling was able to label the plan that you generated correctly uh, as, as feasible, then you'd assume that the human actually prefers that, not your own. And so you can use that uh, reference, the labeling model, to estimate this distance um, approximately, um, indirectly. So that's what winds up being happening when you wind up having to learn those models. Um, so one of the things, actually in that particular case, of course, we are doing labeling process, in that particular work in 17, we used uh, CRFs, but actually later on we used LSTMs and you know from learning from the traces and so some things that you would be familiar with in terms of time series um, and using that time series to figure out preferences would make sense in this case too. Um, from the planning perspective, one slide I want to show you is that actually in AI in general, like there is this whole interest that learned models are obviously correlation based and which is what leads to all these worries about bias you know in, in the models because you're learning from the data and you learn from the data you learn correlational models they may or may not be causal 
Um, things making started from human written models tend to be at least causal from the point of view of the human, and so people from the other pieces of the AI, such as the planning community and so on, would be starting from the causal models. It turns out that when you have to learn, instead of expecting people to give you the model, then these bets are off. So it's, you no longer get to stay in two different extremes. So in fact, you'll wind up learning models that will be part correlational and uh, part uh, causal. And one of the things that we've been showing in some of the work that's going on in these directions is that sometimes learning shallow models, not action preconditioned models, but learning models saying, if you see right foot dropping, right shoe dropping, then after a while, left shoe will drop. I don't know why, but it seems to happen. Okay, this can still be useful in predicting certain things that will happen without having any causal understanding of why that's happening. And sometimes actually the, you know, not surprisingly, sometimes actually the shallow models are easier to learn. And one nice thing about this spectrum is as we go from causal models to the shallow models, and there's a lot of push in the machine learning community to learn increasingly more causal models. You know, would you have heard now these people have been talking about the fact that it's extremely important to figure out which of the models you are learning have, you know, uh, and, 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 and how to ensure that you get causal directional models. Um, but this sort of a spectrum tells you that if the planning people come this side and the learning people go that side, there's actually a way of meeting um, in the middle. That's very important. And uh, in fact, we have shown uh, in other places that learning the shallow models sometimes not only is example sample efficient, it actually can be more effective depending on the task you have. So this one essentially, given the same exact data, same exact trace data, we learn both uh, basically word vector based correlational models. Say if you see this action, then you are likely to see this other action. Um, versus learning a PDDL action precondition effect model. And subject both of them to a plan completion task. Okay, and it turns out that the plan completion task accuracy as measured after the fact is actually higher for the um, shallow model. And one way of understanding what happens there is the shallow model does less of an overfitting to the data than the model which has this more causal uh, you know, information about the preconditions effect. So coming back from there to, expl to explanations, that robot that we had earlier, instead of removing the, the, the obstacle on the, on the direction, the next direction, could have essentially decided to take the path that is optimal for it. And then tell the human that, by the way, you'll be surprised that I took this longer path. The reason for that is, now what is the ease? The reason for that is basically an explanation. There are explanations which involve, the reason for this is my mind. I know stuff you don't know. And I'll give you my entire model. That will be unnecessarily non-parsimonious. What you would like to tell the human is exactly the piece of their model that needs to change so that they too will find that your behavior is actually optimal with the change model. So this winds up reasoning in the space of models. So if planning is hard enough, which is given a model file in the plan, then you are talking about which model to plan in. And that would be a model search for the plans. Um, so in this particular case, so explanation is then these deltas that you are providing to the human's model as to what are the changes that they should make to their model, such as they will also understand that what you're doing is actually okay. Uh, so again, just to show you, you can see some noise there, but basically what it's doing is it's taking a longer path and it's announcing that this other part of the path is closed. And then, of course, anytime you provide an explanation, you hope that people are paying attention. If they do pay attention, then they can say that, okay, this makes, this particular behavior makes sense. Um, so, explanation is very hard right now. Everybody talks about explainable AI. In general, much of it is, part of it is because of the inscrutable representations. You know, if you have a 150 layer neural network, then essentially you have no idea why it found something to be a cat. When it is agreeing with you, you are happy. When it sees a cat and uh, you know says it's a car, you have no clue why it actually made that mistake. Um, and so, in general, there's been a bunch of interest there in pointing explanations, saying these are the pixels, these are the regions that seem to push me towards this particular classification. That's one direction, but a bigger issue when you wind up actually uh, teaming is explanations are also critical for collaboration, like as I am showing you, you know, to make sure that the person in the loop, the human in the loop, understands why 
your behavior is rational, your behavior is making sense because of your beliefs, and now I understand the beliefs. Um, so the model reconciliation view actually also views closer to the psychological theories of how humans provide explanations to each other. Believe it or not, with all the great work that's going on in visual explanations, have you ever asked your friend, when the friend said, this is a cat, you said, why do you think it's a cat? You find that you have barely ever done that. Okay, because visual phenomena, we don't actually expect explanations. We do expect explanations for behaviors. Why the heck did you decide to drop out of MS when you could have done PhD and, you know, taken another 18 years of your life, right? And so those are the kinds of things that we ask questions for. And so model reconciliation, uh, where basically behaviors between two agents are being reconciled in terms of their models, I think is a much bigger issue. And the psychologists actually talk about some of the uh, reasonable properties of explanations, including contrastive property, which we actually wind up using in this case, because when you provide this epsilons in the models, that actually winds up being the case. To give you an example, um, since we're running out of time, let me show you this picture. So what happens in this case is the robot has a model, the human has another model, and it's essentially thinking in the space of models, trying to see what should be the human's model such that the plan it's making is actually optimal in that. And once it figures it out, and then the space here is in terms of the model deltas, you know, adding in a precondition, removing a precondition, adding an effect, removing an effect, these are the deltas. In this search, essentially, it can say, well, if you were in this model, then what I'm doing would have been seen to be optimal by you. So then the delta between, you know, your, the model that you started with and this is the explanation that I have to provide. Okay, yes, sir. If there are multiple optimal models, does this problem become a lot harder because you have to reason about, um, like I can imagine cases where if the optimality function is flat, you have just so it is, it's a, it's, it's a very good point, actually, so in fact, yes, I mean, so if you have a flat optimality, then you still don't know just by the cost itself what the human's model is. But notice that I'm also thinking of model approximations from preferences, and those tend to actually capture different types of models that people have. But it's a very good question. In general, if you have, if you can't get, you know, localize the model, again, this is something that you can actually see this happen in your life, like you know, in your day-to-day -day life. When you're providing explanations to people, you have to localize their beliefs. And you start giving the wrong explanation, at some point of time you realize that you wrongly localize their beliefs, and so you start giving a different explanation. Those of you who have been TAs know this. This is what we do for a living. And research professors don't teach, but you know, the TAs definitely teach, and so they actually have to explain to people in front of them, across the desk, and so you are essentially trying to localize. Okay, so one of the, and of course it turns out this is a crazily hard search because the planning itself is hard. So in each guide 2017, we show how there are a variety of things that you can do to improve uh, this search. Uh, it still doesn't become, um, you know, basically we're not going to be able to show B equal to NP because, you know, essentially the planning itself is space based on it. But you, there is no getting away from the fact that, you know, behavior, some of the optimal behavior problems are even in the simplest cases computationally hard. And explanations are on top of that. And so we actually show how to improve some of the performance in that case. Um, one interesting thing, this is kind of connected to the point that Dana is making, is if you realize that much of the interaction is localizing the human's model, then in a sense, the part of what the robot is doing is trying to figure out not just what my plan should be, but rather what should human's model be such that the plan that I come up with will be optimal in this. We have done this problem in two different pieces, where one case we just went to the human model, which is explicability, and the other case I just did what is best for me and tried to figure out a model for you. But there's obviously a spectrum. I can try to get you halfway, make some changes in your model, and then make my plan. And that's obviously a spectrum where you are computing basically the cost of the plan in the model that in this model for you, plus the cost of communicating these differences. From the, for the human here. And that winds up being a nice, um, um, but like nice spectrum. Actually, there is a paper in NAMAS this year um, which talks about uh, this sort of a explainability explanation trade off 
okay? And then you wind up doing this comp more complex um, optimization where you're taking the cost of the explanation itself in terms of the size of the explanation that you are communicating plus the cost differential in you working in your own model versus that you're working in this other model. And then you're trying to find the model such that, and the plan such that this could be minimized. And that winds up being, you know, obviously giving you the spectrum of the behavior. So it turns out that I showed you two pieces, explicability and explanation, and I showed you how we can also have a spectrum in between. We have started a cottage industry in this area. Um, essentially, there are all sorts of interesting things that you can do on top of this basic piece. And that's all this picture that I won't go into too much detail, but I'll show you three examples that actually make sense in one slide and then end um, okay, the talk. Um, so one, actually this one, by the way, uh, you can't read this unfortunately, but this one is about if all you want to do is keep the human happy with your behavior, what do you do when you want your parents to be happy with what it is that you decided to do? Put yourself in your high school. You tell them a lie. You change their behavior. Oh, there is no school today. That's why I'm not going to school. Okay. The, if all you want is essentially people to come to a point where they won't question you, then you can tell a lie. When you tell a lie, there is no end. This, in the previous case, essentially, this is the ground truth of the robot model. This is the human's model. And essentially, I can, I'm reconciling the human's model to the robot's model in what I believe. When I tell a lie, I can have any models, which is not the robot's model I have. And actually, we have done interesting studies on when do humans feel comfortable when robots tell them white lies. Okay, and not surprisingly, you know, BuzzFeed picked it up and said, AI robots are now lying. AI <laughs> <laughs> yeah, robots are always lying, right? I mean, that's like high, high, high of intelligence. But anyway, so you can do that. Uh, so the three pieces that I just wanted to mention before concluding is you can, uh, in, in this sort of expected explanation, you can handle multiple human agents. One AI system trying to help multiple human agents. You wind up having to provide different explanations to them, each of them, which is what you do as a TA. Each student, you look at their problem and answer them. Or you can say, I'll do a confirmant explanation. I'm doing a confirmant explanation to you all right now. So where I basically consider all your models and essentially provide one size fits all explanation for all of you to and it turns out that in planning, there is idea called transformation planning, which is doing planning without sensing the world. So that, you know, even if you, there's uncertainty in the model, there are three models, uh, and you wind up having one plan that works in all three models. And it turns out that an extension of the confirmation planning winds up working here when you have multiple agents, or uh, there's incompleteness about them. Um, if you have models at different levels of abstraction, this is something that happens oftentimes, the robot might have very detailed knowledge, the AI system might have very detailed knowledge, the human might have a higher level knowledge. And if there's an abstraction like this, then the search now not only is this sort of a trans uh, horizontal transition, but it's actually going in the abstraction hierarchy. And so there's a paper, this paper is in which I caps 2018, this one is uh, presented in HKI 2018. Um, and then I mentioned earlier already, you can actually plan to project intentions. As part of your planning, you can throw in some explanatory actions. Explanatory actions are also actions. And normally we think talking has no sense, but talking has a big effect. It's an effect on other people's minds. And so if you can model that, then that's part of the plan too then. So in fact, that's kind of coming out in IRAS. Um, now, it turns out that in all these cases, actually, one of the issues is if you come up with these ideas and you come up with these um, uh, algorithms, how do you know that people are actually happy with it? And it turns out that you actually have to do human studies. Um, in computer science departments, when I, for the longest time in my career, I didn't know what IRB was, but now I have to know IRB because institutional review boards are very important to ensure that when you're doing or uh, reasoning, then you have people in the loop. So in fact, I wound up collaborating with Nancy Cook uh, with human factors uh, in, in setting up some of these experiments. I don't have too much time to go into this, but I can tell you that there is a paper in HRI uh, which talks about a setup like that explicability explanation setup, which was done in a wizard of, wizard of our setting where there are two humans, one playing the robot, one playing the human commander. And you will try to analyze the kind of explanations humans give to each other in this setting and the kind of times when they expect explanations. And we found, in a sense, 
that the kinds of explanations they are finding, providing, especially on the communication limitations, are things like the smaller, uh, um, you know, minimal complete explanations. And that, the, that in fact, when you show explicable behavior, the amount of time we provide the positive explanations is much lower. Okay. Um, and then I mentioned this uh, earlier that, in fact, once you start having uh, modeling of the mental states of the humans, you can use that in adversarial scenarios. Military is very much interested in adversarial planning. Anybody could be essentially uh, using that to kind of provide explanations that mislead people into having different models of the world under which your particular behavior makes sense. Okay, uh, we have actually a paper uh, that's under review right now, which shows that the same exact planning methodology can be used for cooperation and for obfuscation with just one flick of a switch. Basically, it turns out that it's just model uh, management. And so, as I said, and uh, this is other paper where on mental modeling and acceptable symbiosis in human AI collaboration, which started called from um, this idea of do humans feel good about being lied to? And, uh, and, and of course, that's someone that Weisfried said, Julia yeah. wants to be lied. Okay? So, I'll end here uh, because uh, Hanan wants me to. Um, <laughs> And then say that you know having humans in the loop seems to be too much of a pain in some sense because it seems to increase the complexity of the problem. Okay, um, it would be much nicer if we are on Mars and can ignore humans like before. But then, as uh, Kurt Vonnegut said, if only it weren't for the people, the grand people, to always getting tangled up in the machinery. If it weren't for them, Earth would be an engineer's paradise. I know this CS department is a science department. The one I'm in is an engineering department. Actually, many of us are engineers and we would like humans to get out of the way. But I hope I try to convince you that as a research masochist, having humans in the loop opens up a whole lot of new problems that you can solve and get more papers in. And that's also ultimately, at the end of the day, extremely important. So that's a kind of a summary of the talk. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, when you're analyzing how humans can actually behave, uh, humans are limited by the two senses they have and also the uh, kind of way they express the gesture and um, uh, speech and, and, and uh, that's something that we're limited to. Mm -hmm. But robots are not that. Robots can be and analyze So part of that earlier, we were talking about how to use augmented reality right. to also provide explanations. Right. So, um, that's the part of the how, how do you decide, because now, now because we can provide in so many ways, uh, so many different uh, modalities, uh, the explanations we do, how do you decide like, what, what is the best or like, how do you... That's a good point. I mean, that's an additional piece that we have. We currently focused on the size of the explanation and notice that we didn't talk about how to convert the model differences into language, which is the modality part. Okay. And when we get to that, that itself, you're pointing out that that itself can have different trade-offs. You know, uh, basically trying to give a verbal explanation in some cases is uh, not as efficient as providing a signed explanation. Right. And we haven't done that yet, but certainly that's something that's possible. Because, because I assume on front of it can be very annoying to constantly get explanations. Yes, yeah, so one of the things that in, in, in actually in all of proactive assistance kinds of problems, uh, in fact I think I have this picture too, uh, that uh, in general proactive assistance can be really annoying. If you start giving explanations that people don't want, they get very easily annoyed. And, um, and so there are multiple ways of avoiding that. One is of course do what you're expecting. Okay, which is explicability. That will reduce the amount of time you have for explanation. But I think your point of providing different kinds of explanations, uh, that might be less annoying, might be what we haven't studied that, but that certainly is possible. And we did look at stigmatic explanations, which is you modify the environment and sort of leave markers for people that sometimes helps.